Chapter 18, Jewish Epistles, the book of James, part 2. Problem text. Problem texts become a problem when men bring preconceived ideas and artificial belief systems into their Bible study. This happens to all of us, but becomes perilous when those systems become the proverbial tail that wags the dog. These preconceived ideas cause the Bible students to turn a blind eye to anything outside of their man-made system of study. Like Hebrews chapters 6 and 10, James chapter 2 is often considered problematic and even contradictory to other portions of the New Testament. Sadly, men find it easier to ignore its difficulties rather than to directly address the teachings within their context. With the Lord's help, we will tackle these truths forthright from a Bible-believing perspective. Biblical faith. The supposed problem of the second chapter of James is its direct association of works and faith. For that reason, it is important to establish a biblical definition of faith. Most Christians would find it surprising that true faith always involves doing something. Faith without works is an intangible enigma, better referred to as dead faith. Furthermore, the Bible identifies faith as both substance and evidence. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Bible says that faith is both the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Let that truth sink deep into your heart before proceeding. Saving faith. To avoid confusion, some groundwork must be laid concerning the association of faith, works, and salvation. A man simply cannot earn a place in heaven through his deeds, his merits, or how well he has lived his life. Works do not save, but true salvation always produces good works. Some of the brethren with the worst of personal righteousness after salvation equate this statement to the teaching of lordship salvation, teaching that works precede salvation. That philosophy of change and lordship prior to salvation is nothing short of heresy. Grace is necessary for salvation because nobody deserves heaven. Mercy is necessary because God's justice demands that he judge the guilty. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. Nobody deserves eternal life. So anybody that gets to heaven or receives eternal life does so based upon something outside of his own merit. Heaven is always and will always be attained because of God's grace and mercy. The offer of God's grace and his mercy does not exclude man's responsibility of acting upon that extended mercy and grace. In fact, God does not save a person by grace except by grace through faith. Where there is no faith, grace is thwarted. To explain, if salvation were not a matter of faith, God's grace would indiscriminately save everyone. But God's grace is only attained through faith. Ephesians 2 8. For by grace he is saved through faith, and not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As man's faith brings God's grace and mercy into action, the salvation received manifests itself through a changed life and subsequent good works. Titus 3 1, 3 8, 3 14. James chapter 2 simply identifies the association of right living to true salvation. Faith without works is dead, being alone. This does not imply that works save, but where no works are produced, no faith exists. James 2.18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. No one can show faith except through one's works. Again, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hebrews 11.1, 1. You cannot see grace. But you can see the saving faith, the substance of the grace that saves. Therefore, everyone is saved by grace through faith. There is no grace without subsequent faith to administer the grace. Additionally, faith is the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. Faith becomes the substance of the grace and the salvation that cannot be seen. You cannot see what you are putting faith in, but you can see faith, but only through the works that it produces. Faith is manifested in action. Therefore, faith is the evidence. When the evidence is not apparent, it is because the individual has not grown in grace, 2 Peter 3.18, according to God's will for every believer. The problem addressed by James parallels the problem addressed by Paul in Hebrews. In a moment of conviction, peer pressure, emotional desire, intellectual clarity, many Jews professed faith in Christ, 
but did so without trusting Christ for salvation. They could say they had faith, but their actions negated such a testimony. Paul expressed this same truth when he said, They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Romans 10, 16. In other words, true belief would have brought obedience to the gospel. To further unite faith and works, Hebrews chapter 11 offers a definition of faith and follows with individual testimonies of faith and the actions that followed the faith. This may seem hard to comprehend, but consider that faith has layers or parts within the whole. These layers or aspects can be identified by the acronym CAT, or Knowledge, Assent, Trust, K-A-T. Faith begins with knowledge of what it is that should be believed. For instance, If a man knows that the gospel of Christ refers to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, he has knowledge of the gospel. However, it is possible for someone to know what the gospel is without believing it to be true. This is the state of many of the unsaved. Their knowledge of the gospel goes no further than an intellectual consent. In fact, hell contains many people who have died with only a knowledge of the gospel. Knowledge is obviously not sufficient alone. A man must also believe that the object of faith is true. To reach this aspect of faith, the person must know what the gospel is, knowledge, and believe it to be true, assent. That's the K and the A. But both are still not enough for salvation. There are many people who know and believe that the historical Jesus existed and died upon the cross. Some even know that they can be saved by receiving Christ, but until they do, assent is not enough. To complete faith, one must trust. Trust refers to a personal commitment to and reliance upon an object of faith. In salvation, the sinner must know that Jesus died for him and rose again from the dead. Knowledge. And he must accept that these facts are true. Assent. However, he is still not saved until he relies on these facts, trust, as the basis for the personal salvation. This is CAT, knowledge, assent, trust, K-A-T. The Lordship salvation folks and the Calvinists twist this application on opposite ends of the spectrum. Consider the following simple illustration to affirm these three elements. What if a man were invited into a house and asked to take a seat? How many aspects would be involved in accepting the invitation to sit? First, the man must look over and acknowledge that there is indeed a chair in which to sit. That is knowledge. Next, he would accept the fact that he could sit in the chair without concern of the chair's ability to support him. That is assent. Finally, he would have to walk to the chair and sit down in it. That is trust. It is in this third aspect of faith wherein faith is exercised and made complete. In other words, faith is believing what you hear and then acting upon that belief. When you do not act upon what you hear and what you know to be true, there exists no faith. When a man says, I have faith, but no action or substance follows to demonstrate the faith, he is deceived. Faith is always action. A man's works illustrate, demonstrate, and substantiate his underlying faith. Consider these few examples of the relationship between faith and works found in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11.4, by faith Abel offered. How does one know Abel had faith? Abel offered, faith without works is dead. Hebrews 11.5, by faith Enoch was translated, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. What caused Enoch to please God? His faith. Hebrews 11.7, by faith Noah prepared an ark. How does one know Noah had faith? He prepared an ark. Hebrews 11.8, by faith Abraham obeyed. How does one know Abraham had faith? He obeyed. Hebrews 11.11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. How does one know Sarah had faith? She conceived Isaac. Hebrews 11.17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. How does one know that Abraham had faith? He offered up Isaac. And the examples go on and on. Why? Because of the context or theme of the passage, but without faith it is impossible to please him, Hebrews 11.6. In each case, it is faith that offered, prepared, obeyed, etc. The only means whereby we know someone has faith is through the demonstration of what we can only see through an individual's actions, their works. What is the proof that very few believed God in Noah's day? 
Only eight people entered into the ark. Only those who believed entered the ark. What happened to those in Jericho who did not exercise faith because they believed not? They perished. Why did they perish? The Bible says they perished because they believed not. Hebrews 11.31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not. The story of Jericho simply contrasts the faith of one woman in relation to the lack of faith of the majority. The context of James chapter 2 deals with people who say they have faith but lack any substance to what they say. Though a man may say he hath faith, James 2.14. Yea, a man may say, James 2.18. What you say, your talk about your faith, is irrelevant if those words do not match your walk, your works. This truth, declared by James, no different than Paul's admonition that all those who profess do not necessarily possess. Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Paul is saying that a man's works reveal his true profession. The only way to spot a false profession is by examining a man's works. In other words, those who have vain professions have no substance to that profession. Jesus himself warned against such people during his earthly ministry. Matthew 15, 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. When a man's actions contradict his words, his actions often expose the truth cloaked by the hypocritical speech. James simply confirms this truth when he pointed to a talker that may say he had faith, but demonstrated his lack of faith. James clearly set forth that the man's works gave the best description of the man's condition. The man claiming faith without works was a vain man, James 2.20. But wilt thou say, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Man's empty faith yokes him to the belief that the devils possess. The devils possess factual information, knowledge, but had no faith in what they knew to be true. James 2.19 Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Interestingly, the Apostle Paul pointed to this same type of vain belief when defining the gospel. Apparently, some Corinthians believed in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, but refused to trust that gospel for salvation. They, like the devils, believed in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul also noted this failure in faith in Ephesians when he emphasized that one must possess more than a mere intellectual sense of the truth. He must follow that knowledge of the truth, the belief, with a trust in Christ. Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. There must be substance to belief and not simply some type of intellectual consent to a historical reality. The book of James, along with other writers, dealt with saving faith while warning against any type of vain belief. A vain man can say yes to all the facts but never trust the Savior for salvation. Faith and works. All the most prominent New Testament passage declaring that a man is saved by grace and not by works includes statements that works should follow salvation. This emphasizes God's expectations for his newborn children. God expects for a saved person to live like he is saved. Additionally, a man may say he has faith, but can only show that faith through his godly, sober, and righteous life. In fact, the grace that saves also teaches right living. Furthermore, the mercy that saves also invites the saint to maintain good works. The individual holds the choice to obey. Titus 2.11 For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 3.5 Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Verse 8 this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Good works are the result of saving faith. 
As stated, passages chronicling the salvation of a soul are followed by admonitions to good works, Colossians 3, 1 through 5. To illustrate a prime example of the truth, consider Ephesians 2, 8 along with its context. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace he is saved through faith, that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The implications from this passage are easy to digest. Man is saved by grace through faith, not of works. However, works are the evidence and the outworking of that salvation. A lack of evidence is either no salvation or a lack of obedience following salvation. This is the key. James chapter 2 teaches that if you claim faith but do so without fruit, there is no substance to your faith. In fact, it is dead faith or no faith at all. Dead faith is likened to a corpse. Without the spirit inhabiting the body, the body is dead. If one's profession of faith does not have any works to back it up, it is dead faith. Where true faith exists, good works follow, regardless of dispensation. In other words, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17. To illustrate, consider again Rahab. According to James 2.25, she heard, believed, and acted upon her belief. Had she not sent the spies out another way, hung the scarlet thread, stayed home, she would have physically died with the others in Jericho. What did each of her actions reveal? Faith. Failure to do any of those things would have clearly testified that she lacked faith. Abraham's Justification Although most Bible students should be convinced of the truths taught thus far, there remains some perplexities yet to be considered. One complexity involves Abraham's justification. To be fair, the problem comes because of the misunderstanding of a couple of passages appearing to the reader to be contradictory. Consider these two verses together. James 2.21 Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? James 4.2 For if Abraham were justified by works, he had where of the glory, but not before God. How can both verses be true? Apparently, Romans says Abraham was not justified by works, while James says he was justified by works. How can a man that is not justified by works also be justified by works? Surely, we can agree that a problem seems to exist. The problem is either in the text or in our understanding of the text. You already know and believe that both texts are true and right. The answer is quite simple. Unfortunately, many Bible teachers imaginatively arrive at some wild conclusions. For example, some teachers claim that the passage teaches that Abraham was justified as a Gentile pre-circumcision by faith and later was justified as a Jew post-circumcision by works. That would certainly support the notion that Old Testament Jews were justified by works and the New Testament saints were justified by faith. The only problem being... By him, the Lord Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses, Acts 13, 39. This one truth negates the theory of any type of works being involved in salvation. Before delving further into the conundrum, one must consider the biblical definition of justification. While some might be quick to say justification is the act of making one just before God, that definition would contradict many examples like Job who justified himself, Job 32, 2. Israel, who hath justified herself, Jeremiah 3, 11, And a certain lawyer that asked, Who is my neighbor? Because he was willing to justify himself, Luke 10, 29. The definition of justification must involve much more. In other words, justification actually involves a man's declaration of his justness or his righteousness in a matter, and as such, the justification could be true or it could be contrived. It could also be before God or men or both. When Abraham was justified, a declaration was made of his justness or his righteousness. Those who substitute the word justify in place of salvation or the event of salvation run into some serious issues when considering Luke 7.29 where the people justified God. Instead of man-made parameters for defining Bible words, one needs to let God set his own parameters for how to define Bible words. This offers the individual a much better understanding of justification. Considering the biblical meaning, a man 
could be justified any number of times, e.g. Abraham, do not miss the point. To help clear up the muddy waters, one needs to look no further than the context of the two seemingly contradictory passages previously discussed. Contextually, Romans 4.2 rehearses the events of Genesis chapter 15, and James 2.21 rehearses the events of Genesis chapter 22. The following chart depicts these two events. The chart is on page 281 concerning the New Testament passages and continues to page 282. The astute Bible student is likely already taking note of the context and stated purpose of the work of offering Isaac. One might assert that Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac was his required work to obtain salvation, but that negates an obvious fact. Abraham did not offer Isaac. Instead, the Bible declares that Abraham's willingness to offer Isaac simply perfected his faith, James 2.22. Better yet, it fulfilled the scripture's previous declaration, which saith Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness, James 2.23. Abraham was declared just when he initially believed God concerning his seed. He was again declared just when he put action to that faith by raising the knife to slay his own son, fully expecting that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham's work fulfilled or perfected the initial faith. Abraham's initial faith was exercised when he believed the gospel preached to him and his belief was accounted to him for righteousness. That is justification by faith. James posed the rhetorical question, inferring that the reader would naturally understand the right answer. After Abraham had offered Isaac, he was justified. Abraham believed that God was going to bless him through his seed Isaac, and yet he was willing to obey God despite what seemed completely illogical. Abraham willingly sacrificed his son because he believed God would resurrect him. The Bible says that Abraham rejoiced to see my day when he believed in a resurrection and witnessed the substitution type and shadow, John 8, 56. He certainly did not see or understand Christ's work on the cross except in picture and type. By faith, Abraham walked up the mountain bound Isaac upon the altar, raised his knife into the air to slay his son. Hebrews 11:17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him as a figure. God told Abraham that he was going to bless him through his seed Isaac. Abraham showed God his faith through his actions. Think about it. God knows everything, but God's knowledge becomes experiential when he observed Abraham's faithful obedience. Genesis 22:12, And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. The only reason we know for certain that Abraham believed God concerning a seed is because Abraham was willing to slay his seed and watch God raise up Isaac again. Truly, faith without works is dead. Faith is substantial. Faith is evidential. Every single example of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 shows a person doing what God said to do. Intellectual belief is not enough. A man must and will act upon that which is truly believed. James 2.14 What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man may say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? Verse 17 Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. This is the end of chapter 18.